Okay, I'm gonna get started this morning. I hope my voice will back here in a few minutes. <laughs> Somewhere stuck in my throat. They say a cough drop that I think has been up here since the 70s. <laughs> it was really soft, chewy. I don't think it helped, I think it got stuck. <laughs> All right. So we have been talking about grace and harmony in the body, and uh, we're shifting gears. Now it's grace and power in the body. Now, grace is the means that gives us power to live this Christian life and to live it well. <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is understanding legalism. We've seen how submission to the Holy Spirit is key to harmony in the local church. If, if we as individuals are not submitting to the Holy Spirit's power in our life, there's no way that we will live in harmony with one another. Because then we'll be living out of the flesh instead of spirit. When we live out of the flesh, it's always about me. It's always about what I want, not what is best for the body. <clears throat> So submission's key to the Holy Spirit. Paul, in fact, told us in the Bible to keep the unity that the Holy Spirit has established. What does that mean? It means that when you and I got saved, we automatically were given the peace that passeth understanding living inside of us. We've had an automatic love for the brethren placed inside of our hearts, our brand new hearts. And Paul admonished the church to keep that unity. Let the unity that God has placed in you out so that the body will function in a harmonious, tranquil way. We will see that today, how the Holy Spirit accomplishes this unity. <clears throat> I've spoken to you before about the law. And how in the new covenant, you and I have been set free from the law. We're no longer under the law. The law served its purpose in bringing you to the foot of the cross. It, it pointed out how filthy you were, how sinful you were. It pointed out how you had zero righteousness before an almighty and holy God. And it brought you and me to the end of the rope where we threw up our hands and said, God, I will never be good enough to earn my way to heaven in and of my own abilities. I need your grace in my life. And Jesus happily invited each and every one of us in. Unfortunately, many Christians pick up the law right after they get saved and they try once again to live by it, to please God, to gain his acceptance when he already loves us and accepts us because we put our trust in Jesus Christ. When we invite the law back into our lives and try to live by this list of to do's and to don'ts, it's like a bow constrictor. So imagine the snake is the law and it constrains us. It gets us off of living from Jesus' power and gets us focused once again on our abilities to live the Christian life. So why do we feel so constricted? It's because we've invited the law or legalism <clears throat> back into our Christian experience. Christ purposefully died on the cross so that we would not invite the law back into our life. Because it never saved anyone, and it never brings life. The Bible's very clear. The law brought death. That's it. That's all it brings to your life is death. Believers controlled by the flesh produce conflicts. Again, if we live by the law, if we live by the flesh, all we're going to do is be criticizing ourselves and others, and that will bring conflict. Believers controlled by the Spirit bring tranquility to the body. Because we learn to submit, we learn to forgive, 
uh, we learn to assuage to others so that harmony can continue. Because it's not about me, it's about us. Paul admonished the early church at Corinth. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you, look at these, envying, strife, <clears throat> and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? I mean, what's the difference between your typical evangelical church and the unsafe people on the outside of the building? And oftentimes, nothing except you know where to find the book of John in a Bible. Yes, we know verses. Yes, we, we know how to dress and comb our hair and not curse as much. But in many places, what's the difference? We got envyings. We got strife. We got divisions. He said, she said. No one's getting along. And it's not what God ever intended. <clears throat> and it was already happening in the early church. In fact, Paul went on in Ephesians and encouraged the church at Ephesus, the Christians there, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, why would he tell them to be controlled by the Holy Spirit? Because they weren't. They were letting the flesh control them. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, where is its excess? But look at this. Be filled with the Spirit. Thank you. Now, I want to point out that this doesn't mean that someone's cup was empty and they needed more spirit filling. It doesn't mean that you come to church on Sundays to get filled with spirit power so you can burn it for the rest of the week and then circle back next Sunday to be filled again. The way it's interpreted is it's be being filled. You've already received the spirit. Now allow the spirit to guide you, allow the spirit to run over. It's an idea of a cup being filled with water and it's spilling over. Be being filled. You already got the spirit. Let the spirit control your life. Let the spirit do God's will in your everyday thoughts and attitudes and speech and actions. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to guide you. How do we do that? We submit to it. We submit to it. So Paul is telling the church in Corinth to be to uh, follow the Spirit. He tells the church in Ephesus the same, to be being filled. Then we read later on in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 21. How do we do this? Submitting yourselves one to another. In the fear of God. <clears throat> Submit yourselves one to another. Put other people's preferences above your own. Love them the way God loved us. <laughs> Only believers in submission can submit to one another. Are we in submission to God? If we can submit to an almighty God, we can submit to one another. It just goes that way. It's easier. We're not submitting to God. We're like, I ain't God. I ain't doing that. It's a lot easier to tell someone in your fellowship, I ain't doing that either. I'm not listening to God, and I'm not listening to you. And then strife and envyings and divisions happen in the body. You guys think about it. We've all been... In a church setting where envyings and strife and divisions have happened. Where are we being guided by the Spirit? Spirit brings unity, not divisions and envyings and strife. So he tells the church in Ephesus, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. If we can submit to God, we can submit to one another and love one another and forbear one another, etc. <clears throat> Want you guys to understand this because this maybe isn't something that you have grasped before. The flesh and legalism, also referred to as externals, and this is something outside of you, 
are the same thing. They're synonymous. What's flesh? The flesh, I've told you in the past, it's like a splinter. It's a something foreign uh, that was outside of your body and now placed inside your body, right? It's in you, but it's not part of you. The moment you got saved, the old man was, say it, buried, killed off and buried in the ground. When Christ raised you to newness of life, where did the old man stay? In the ground. However, the old man's thought patterns, attitudes, reactions stayed with us. And now we have a choice every day. Do we respond to people from the old man's thought patterns, or do we respond to people in newness of life? If we submit to the spirit, we can respond to newness of life. So I want you to understand that flesh and legalism is the same thing. It's something external outside of us. It's in you, but it's not part of you. None of you would ever say, yeah, this splinter's part of me. I want it out. Whenever my kids... Uh, get a splinter, they immediately come to me, and um, they don't go to mom. I don't know if she's dug too much with a needle, and they don't like that. But somewhere along the line, I inherited some gigantic um, magnifying glasses, and they're really cool. They're like on like an actual glass, and you can pop in different levels of magnification. So I get these on, and my eyes are like saucers, and I can, in my blindness, can see splinters. Um, really, really well, so I can precision dig them out. So the splinter's in my kid's skin, but it's not part of them, and they want it out. We do not have to listen to the old man anymore. Some of us maybe had uh, really bad tempers um, before we got saved, and we don't have to react that way anymore. We can respond in a calm and and thoughtful way, they don't have to jump off the handle. Um, when someone makes fun of you, maybe a lot of you were made fun of as a kid. You, you didn't like it and you reacted in a hateful or, or violent way. And now as an adult, when someone slights you, you don't have to respond that way anymore. It's not who you are. See, the rejection that we received as an unsaved person is not the same now as a saved person because we are accepted by the most important God of the universe. And if he accepts us, who cares what our coworker thinks about us? Who cares about what the kid next door says we look like or act like or whatever? See, we don't have to listen to the flesh anymore. We don't have to do things in order to try to gain acceptance from God because he fully accepts us. Understand that the flesh and legalism and external one are completely opposite of this thing called grace. Now, remember, grace is the power that we utilize to live our Christian life today. It's not the flesh. It's not you trying hard. It's not legalism following a list of to do's and to don'ts. It's not external. Grace is internal. You received it the moment you trusted Jesus Christ. That is your source of power for living. It doesn't matter if we're a grace-filled Christian or a legalist Christian. Any Christian's goal in life is to live a pure life that honors Christ. You talk to anyone. We can go to any legalist church this morning and ask, what's your goal in life? I just want to live a good life for God. Would you guys not agree? I want to live a pure life. I don't want... But the problem is the method of getting there. How do we get there? The legalist is a very different method from a new covenant believer who's putting their trust and faith in Jesus Christ to be honorable to God, to live a pure life. And this is the key for you and me. We have to understand legalism. Grace is taught throughout the New Testament as the only way for a Christian to have power in his or her life. Christ always condemned legalism, especially when he spoke to the Pharisees. 
mean, you look up the definition of legalism and it's the Pharisees in the dictionary waving back at you. They were the epitome of legalism. Do we have modern day Pharisaical attitudes? Absolutely. There are people walking and talking. You've met them, I'm sure. We have Pharisees even today. Christ always condemned that attitude. Paul wrote Galatians, the whole book of Galatians, not only to condemn men's efforts to save themselves, but to also show the believer that they cannot produce any spiritual fruit whatsoever in the energy of the flesh. So remember that. <clears throat> Galatians thought, maybe I can do something to earn my salvation. That's legalism. And then after I'm saved, maybe I can still do things to earn God's love and acceptance of me. But he said, you'll never produce any spiritual fruit if it's energized by the flesh. If Christians do not understand this, it leads to powerless lives and critical attitudes that cause divisions in the church. Think about this. Listen, our goal is still the same, no matter if we're a legalist or a grace-loving Christian. The methods of how we get there are diametrically opposed. Grace works internally. We utilize the power of Jesus Christ that he put inside of us to power us. We're not trying to do things on the outside to get power. We're working from an internal power that God gave us. Remember, God has never asked us to do anything in our lives that he has not equipped us to do. So if he's told you and me that we can live the Christian life, that means he's given us the means to do so. Don't look outside of God for power to live the life that he's asked you to live. Look to him and him alone. A legalist always works externally by trying to keep God's standards in the energy of their own flesh. I can do this. I can be the Christian that God wants me to be. <clears throat> Understand that legalism produces conformity. Legalism and grace never mix. It's like water and oil. Romans 8, 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. <coughs> legalism produces conformity. Legalism has the appearance of good works. We can go to some legalistic churches. We can sit in our cars in the parking lot and videotape everyone walking in. They look good. Hair's parted right. They might even have a gigantic Bible underneath their arm. Not a little one, not on their phone, a big one. That's Holy Bible and gold letters. Their kids can be filing in right behind them in single file. They're not fighting. They're not cursing at each other. It's an intact, perfect-looking family. Legalism produces conformity, and conformity has the appearance of good works, and it's often mistaken as spiritual maturity. Have you guys seen this before in churches? They look great. That family has it all together. I wish we could be like them. They are always smiling. They're always praising Jesus. Their kids are always happy and well-mannered. Two, three years later, we find out they're divorced. Their kids are on drugs. And on and on the list goes. Like, how did this happen? Legalism has the appearance of good works. Underlying, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on that we don't know about till later when it comes out.
there's several women and men who have gone to great lengths to make themselves look like Ken and Barbie. You guys know Ken and Barbie? The doll that came out in the, I don't know, 40s or 50s? She's been altered a little bit, sometimes more than not. But there are some actual human beings who want to look like Ken and Barbie, and they've gone to great lengths of plastic surgery and all kinds of stuff to look just like them, to conform to the image of what they believe beauty is. I mention that because saints do the same thing. Who's the super Christian out there? What can I do to look more like them? What do I need to do to be more like them? Uh, who do I need to listen to? What books do I need to read? How should I start to part my hair? And I'm going to change my fashion. I mean, I can remember when every woman wanted Jennifer Aniston's haircut. And every salon had to learn how to cut hair like Jennifer Aniston's because I want the Jennifer Aniston haircut. I don't know what the guys are going for now. There's a certain haircut that we ask for. But again, even the saints will try to change themselves externally so that they look like, act like, and they even start saying phraseologies. They want to sound like super Christian that they believe God would be more pleased with. Saints look alike, dress alike, act alike, etc. When in reality, they are exercising fleshly legalism and not spiritual working of Christ in their lives. God doesn't want us to look like cookie cutters. Never intend that. It's made us all unique. What we have in common is him and the love for one another. Only the spirit can strip away the externals and bring a fresh life to a church. The spirit first deals with issues of faith and prayer and witnessing and attitudes and fellowship and in love. That's the spirit's first goal, changing the inside, right? Saved us and he loves us so much he doesn't leave us the way we are. He transforms us. An external church is more worried about external things. Most fellowships, they deal with the external issues first. Things not, that not only increase spiritual pride, but tend to add conformity and bondage to the Christian law keeping, leading to a debilitating death in the body. You want to kill off a church quick? Create a list of do's and don'ts. People get frustrated and burned out real quick. It's like water and oil. They don't go together. They're never intended to go together. So don't put them together. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. All right. So let's go back to some Bible real quick. We were in Adam. We needed to be in God. At salvation, he took us out of Adam. We are now in Christ. Amen? So we walk not after Adam anymore. We walk after the Spirit because we're in Christ. But you have that option now. You are no longer in the flesh. No longer in Adam. You are now in Christ, but you have a choice. Walk after the flesh, or you can walk after the spirit. If you want to fulfill the law, we walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. We could paraphrase Romans 8 4 by saying, trying to live a righteous life in the energy of the flesh rather than in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what that verse says. Now, if you're honest, and I'll be honest, I've tried to live the Christian life in the flesh, and it's exhausting. 
and you will fail. You're designed to fail. The only way that you and I can live the Christian life in any power, with any victory, with any success, is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Understand God's standards, God's standards do not change. We fulfill God's standards and through walking after the spirit, not after the flesh. Legalism is anything done in the flesh, whether good or bad. Anything done in the flesh, whether good or bad. This is where he told the Galatians they were saved. And then he walks up to them and says, are you guys so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, having trusted the spirit to save you, are you now made perfect by the flesh? The bow constrictor was taken off of them at salvation. And then they invited the bow constrictor to come back and time up again. We oftentimes will do the same thing. It makes no sense. But here we see legalism is not only doing something to obtain salvation, but legalism is also doing something after a Christian is saved. <clears throat> there are some Christian denominations that tell you you have to do X, Y, and Z to be saved. You got to jump through these hoops to get saved. You got to do certain things. We say trust in Christ. That's it. Not some special prayer with you got to say the right words. It's putting your faith in Jesus Christ. It's your Lord and Savior. That's it. Other places you got to do this, this, and this, and that, and that. And, and then after we get saved, we can still be a legalist because then we can still create a list. Anything done in the flesh, whether good or bad. Remember in the Garden of Eden, there's a tree of good and Evil doesn't matter if you're trying to do something good or something evil. It's the same problem. You're trying to do it in the flesh. A lot of Christians try to do stuff in the flesh. Same tree, still a problem. It's still legalism, whether it's a good act or a bad act. Legalism is a man trying to do something in the power of the flesh to gain acceptance with God before or after we are saved. The core issue is a legalist does not feel unconditionally loved and accepted by God. Let's say that again. Here's the core issue. And this goes back to you and me even after we're saved. The problem for the legalist is that they do not believe, they don't believe, well, they don't feel unconditionally loved and accepted by God. Now, what's the truth? If you are saved, are you unconditionally loved and accepted by God? Answer, yes, I am. But when we don't feel that way, guess what it does? It drives us to do things to make us feel like God will love and accept us. Oftentimes it comes after we've messed up. We've done something really bad. Even after we promised God, we wouldn't do it. The legalist does not feel unconditionally loved and accepted by God. This person then strives to perform better, trying to earn God's love and acceptance. The problem is we become our own worst enemy. We start looking in the mirror and we get very critical of ourselves. You call yourself a Christian. How could you call yourself a Christian after the way you've acted, the things that you said, the things that you haven't done? We begin to criticize ourselves. And when we get a critical spirit about ourselves, it makes it super easy then to get critical about other people. Because we're feeling down, and like any bully, we start tearing other people down so that we can feel better. See how the strike and divisions can happen in a church of legalists? I screwed up, so now I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. 
point my bony finger at you when I'm the one who messed up first. I'm just not willing to admit it in an atmosphere of grace and ask you to pray for me, but rather enforce more rules so that it'll never happen again. And then God will love us more and accept us. Doesn't work that way. Never will. They become very critical of themselves and others. Why? Because they judge others the same way they believe God's judging them. Is God Guido? Is he some mafia hitman up in heaven with a big club waiting for you and me to mess up so he can smack us? Beat us under the ground and turn us into pulp. Is that your God? Why do we think that then sometimes? Oh man, God's upset with me. God's kicking my butt this week because I haven't been good lately. God's not Guido. Amen. He's a loving God, <laughs> forgiving God, the God that opens his arms when we've messed up. We start judging other people because we think this is the way God's judging us. You got to replace that with the truth. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ took upon himself the sins of the world so that we would not have to endure punishment. <clears throat> Legalists, like birds, flock together. Legalists hang out with other legalists. They start churches. They get a legalist pastor. Come on over. It's great over here. We got high standards. We don't have any of that messed up stuff like other churches have. We keep our place straight and clean. They flock together and then they scrutinize each other and they apply peer pressure to everyone to perform to their perfect standards. And what I'm saying, they're going to add on man-made stuff, folks. You're not going to find it in the Bible. They're going to add stuff. You've all heard it. How long is your hair supposed to be? Ladies, how short is your hair allowed to get? How long your dress should be, facial hair. And back in the day, it was down to wire rimmed glasses. You weren't allowed to have wire rimmed glasses. No dancing, no drinking, no smoking, no chewing. Fill in the blanks. Man made stuff. Some of it, probably not a bad idea. The Bible talks about modesty. The Bible talks about um, things in, uh, you know, not in excess, moderation. <laughs> Good ideas, but when we start making rules, <clears throat> so these people gather together. Again, their goal is good but their methods are unattainable. It's not what they do for God, it's their faith in what Christ has done for them. That's where the focus needs to be. Galatians 5.15, but if ye bite and devour one another, take ye that ye be not consumed of one another. Holy standards alone are not legalism. I want you guys to get that. God's standards never change. Praise the Lord. They never change. And they alone are not legalism. Legalism is when we make these holy standards the gauge for spirituality. Let me say that again. When we take these standards and make them a gauge for spirituality, that equals legalism. So if I go to a movie theater that shows rated R movies and my legalist brother sees me walking into the theater and he judges me for going to a theater 
And I might not even be seeing a rated R movie. I might be going to see the PG. But in their mindset, I see you walking into that movie theater. I don't know if you're going to the PG movie or the rated R movie. Therefore, you should not go to that movie theater, period. And now I'm going to judge Aaron as less spiritual because of what he did. And because I didn't go into that movie theater, I am more spiritually mature. You guys get this? We got our lists. We all have lists. And you need to throw them away. The game is played, which leads to pride and hypocrisy. And that leads to moral judgments on each other, which leads to Christian cannibalism towards one another. Isn't that what the verse says? You start to consume one another. We bite and devour. Does that sound like a fellowship you want to go hang out at? Me neither. Me neither. I don't want to be part of that. Legalism focuses only on what the believer does and not what the believer is. There is plenty of mistakes in the early church. You read Paul's letters. The first thing he says when he starts out his letters to the churches, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints at Galatia, to the saints at Ephesus, he starts off reminding them who they are. And it's not until far into each book, after he establishes who they are, does he get into the nitty gritty of telling them what they need to start doing less of and more of. The legalists could care less that you're a child of God. They want you to look like one and talk like one, part your hair like one. Grace-filled person is reminding the new Christian who they are, even the old Christian, who you are in Jesus. And letting the Holy Spirit's power change the way the young lady dresses and wears the makeup and et cetera, et cetera. That's called giving people grace. Christians don't do certain things automatically. They're labeled as spiritual. This is not biblical. How then do we evaluate Christian spirituality? Well, you evaluate them the way Jesus said to evaluate them. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. There's spiritual maturity right there. If we love each other and can forgive one another and can move forward, not holding that sin that they wrongfully did to us, not holding that against them, moving forward, that's love. Where we can openly communicate to each other in a body of unity and move forward. That's spiritual maturity. As I was preparing the sermon, I missed out on a, a second time opportunity to watch a movie with my kids called Amish Grace. It's about the schoolhouse shooting, and how the Amish family forgave the shooter and his family. Look it up. Amish Grace is the movie. Streaming now. But if we can forgive like that when someone, for no apparent reason, takes a loved one from us, that's love. That's spiritual maturity. Your love for one another. Now, I don't want to belabor this too much, but historically, Religious groups have institutionalized religion in order to preserve their doctrines. Roman Catholics preserve their doctrines in lots of writings. Judaism did it with the Talmud and the Mishnah. 
Christianity with all of our creeds. From the Bible, but not in the Bible, and in order to preserve the writings, in order to preserve, in many ways, man's tradition. I'm not saying the creeds or any of these other things are wrong, but unfortunately, with them often comes a rigid institutionalized structure that hinders individual relationships with God. The movements gain external <clears throat> conformity from believers, but it was apart from inner experience. And oftentimes all morphed into authoritarian leadership <clears throat> where they did the thinking for you, you did the listening. They did all the thinking and communicating while the followers became indoctrinated recipients, listening to the wisdom of the so-called sages of wisdom. You guys think about the structures in those three bodies that I've mentioned. What are they focused on? We follow this creed. We recite this one and we follow this book and that book and we got certain traditions that we're going to do. People get more identity from that church than they do having an interpersonal relationship with Christ. I am a Christian before I'm a Baptist. I tell people I'm a Christian with Baptistic leanings. That's what I tell them. We don't have Baptists slapped on our name out there anyway. But we will dunk you all the way. Now, pastors, just like historically religions has gotten this hierarchical structure, will tell you what to think, say, and do. Authoritarian pastors adopt the same thing. And it does make things a lot easier. For them produces results. I'm going to tell you what to do, and you guys are going to go do it. But go out, and I don't want you to come back next Sunday until you have someone new with you. It'll produce results. You're going to fret all week. Pastor Aaron, if I don't bring someone, I'm not spiritual. I'm going to go bust my butt, make sure I bring someone in here, even if I got to pay him 20 bucks. Find a bum on the street because I've already tapped out all my relatives. The last time he got this bring someone to church idea, right? It does produce results, and it does feed the pastor's ego. Unfortunately, his followers develop a toxic faith as they blindly follow a doctrine and direction of the leader. They will work hard, but eventually they'll burn out as they have no independent, strong relationship with Christ themselves. And it's all dependent through their leader. The pastor becomes a mini Jesus instead of them having a personal relationship with Jesus. Because they have no inner strength of their own. They're always totally dependent on this authoritarian. Now, this authority attracts believers who are comfortable with it because it's easy for you. I've had people come up and tell me, Pastor, just tell us what we need to do. I like a list of one, two, three that I can knock out from Sunday till next Sunday. And all you do is talk about who I am in Jesus. Just tell me what to do. That person grew up in a legalistic church. And they always were given a list of things to do or not to do. And I guarantee most of the time you failed. Sunday through next Sunday. I'm like, oh, I hope he gives us something new because I don't want to focus on what I didn't do last time. You burn out eventually because it's all about external stuff. And again, on the outside, it looks like a unified fellowship and spiritually mature because they're all look alike, talk alike, act alike, dress alike but there's no real heart movement towards God.
I have preached the way of grace since I've been here. It's what we focus on more. If I can get the believer to understand that they are unconditionally loved and accepted by God, there's a greater chance that you're going to rely on him and him alone for the power to live the Christian life. You're not going to try to make a list of your own. God is already pleased with you because he's pleased with Christ's performance. How well did Christ perform? He performed 100%. He got an A plus, and he's pleased with his performance. And if you put your faith in his performance, you will always be unconditionally loved and accepted. And that feeling will always be part of you. And when you don't have that feeling, you can dismiss it with the truth of God's word so that you don't have to engage in legalism to try to gain it when you don't, when you never lost it. Amen. Psalms 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, lowercase g, and all of you are children of the Most High. Let's stand and pray this morning.